Okay, good morning, everyone. Now, welcome to BC308 course of Krishna and Daniel. Uh, let's take a moment to pray and then we will get started. Could one of us please pray? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you under the name of Jesus. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the class we are about to have, Jesus. And God, uh, as we are listening uh, to Revelation, Lord, I pray that Jesus, you help us to understand uh, the truth, your words, Jesus, as pastor teaches us, Lord, help us to open our mind and heart, our spiritual eyes and us to listen and to be fully convinced in our faith so that we can boldly go out and preach the gospel. Thank you for Pastor Ashish, and I thank you for all my classmates over here, Jesus. Give us a good Wi-Fi connection through the, throughout the session. Let everything that we do be done for your glory. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 All right. We have started our journey in the book of Revelation. We or in Revelation chapter 2, our last, last time we met. And uh, we looked at the first of the seven churches, the message that the Lord Jesus was speaking. Uh, just to review a, a, a few points, and we won't go through everything, a few points, and then we'll close, close, close out on on the message the Lord Jesus gave to the church in Ephesians. So what is interesting is that as the Lord is speaking to each of these seven churches in, in chapters 2 and 3, there's one that some common things we notice. So one is we said uh, the Lord Jesus introduces himself to each church. And then it ends, so the Lord Jesus begins speaking, but it always ends with, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So that's the pattern in, in, to all of the seven churches. The Lord speaks, and he introduces himself in a particular way to each church, each local church. I am like this, and, and this, and this. And then it always concludes by saying, hear what the Spirit is saying. So we said that uh, the Lord is speaking, the Lord Jesus was the head of the church, he's speaking, and it's the Holy Spirit who's bringing that message to each church, and uh, he does that even today. So even in our day and time, as leaders, uh, our prayer must be, Lord, what is the Lord Jesus saying to the church? And listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying, because the Holy Spirit is the one who communicates that to us as leaders. Now, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit only speaks to leaders, but obviously the Holy Spirit speaks to every believer. But as leaders, we are in that place of responsibility where we have to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. So that's a common thing we see in all seven churches, which we pointed out. And the other thing was, uh, for every church, for every church, and this is very interesting, for all of the seven churches, Jesus begins by saying, I know your books. It's very interesting. That's how he starts his conversation. To all the seven churches, he starts with this sentence, or with this phrase, sorry. I know your works. Now, we would think that the Lord would have said, I know your heart. Uh, no. He's saying to all the seven churches, I know your works. Now, we're not putting, you know, we're not trying to elevate works. We live by faith. Our heart is important. But I think there's a message here. And when the Lord is saying, to all the seven churches, the first thing he says, I know your words. 
I think the message is, you know, like in, in English, we have this phrase, actions speak louder than words. That means it's easy for us to say this and say that and say that. Ultimately, what will you do? Right? What are you going to follow? Are you going to follow through with action? You know, because easy words are easy, but we can always make promises, we can always say this and this and that. But what are you actually doing? I think that's where the emphasis is. Because the Lord is saying to each of he begins by saying, I know your works. That means the Lord is watching. What are we actually doing? Not all the nice things we promise and we say, God, I love you. God, I'll do whatever you tell me. God, I'll do whatever you send me. God, whatever you tell me, I will speak. And, you know, we can always say all those words, which is good. I mean, it's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's an expression of our commitment to the Lord. And we need to pray those prayers of dedication. We need to pray those prayers. But ultimately, the question is, what do you actually do? Because I can say, God, I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek you. Wonderful. But do you actually, does that actually translate into some action? Am I actually going to go and seek God? So I think that's something just keep in mind because Jesus, the Lord Jesus, is looking at what we are actually doing. To all these churches, they say, I know your works. I know what you're doing. I'm observing that. I see what you're doing. And then, based on that, he, he gives a message to each of these seven churches. So, now, to the church in Ephesians, specifically, you know, this church was like we said last night, a very, very wonderful local church. Wonderful. Wonderful. And everything was going really good in terms of their activity, right? in terms of what they were doing, everything was going good. So, from the natural, if somebody came and saw this church, it's a very wonderful church. Yeah, yeah very persevering, they're very discerning, they're very enduring, uh, all of that. But the Lord pointed out one thing. He said, you have left the first one. So like we said last time, I'm just kind of reviewing some of these things. He didn't say they didn't have the first one. They've left the first one. That means if you ask the church, do you love Jesus? That's a we love Jesus. That's what we are saying. That's what we're doing all the time. We love Jesus. But the question is, do you love him first? Because that's the commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your with all of your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And that's what we have to ask ourselves. Do I love him first? Is he my first love? She says, you left your first love. It's not that you don't have love for the Lord, but he's not first in that place. It's like you move from that place. But what is so serious is that when they have left their first love, Jesus says, you have fallen. That means you've gone down, not going up. On that. It says, no, from where you've fallen. Verse 5, Revelation 2, verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. So when I leave my first love, it only puts me into a place of decline. It doesn't get me up. But let's put it around the other way, the positive way. If I keep the Lord as my first love, and I increase in my first love, then I'm going to go up high. If leaving my first love means I'm going to go down, I'm going to decline, then keeping my first love and increasing in my first love means I'm going to become a go up higher spiritual realm in the love of God. As as for the love of God and in our devotion. So 
to go up higher in the spiritual realm. What must I do based on this? I must increase in my first step. So then I'm on a way or on an upward journey, upward trend in my spiritual level. So, and the last and the last thing, verse six, that is what we so we went there. Uh, we talked about how I said, you know, verse five, I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent, which is a very serious thing. That means this local church could be going on here, but they have no connection with heaven. Their, their lampstand has been removed from its place in the presence of God, which is a very serious thing. So it means this church is functioning here like a nominal thing, it's going on, but it's not one of the churches that actually represent heaven on the earth. It's not connected to them. So on the earth, yeah, it'll be functioning like a church. Things that we have from all these things we going on, but there's no life coming from heaven. That's a very sad state. It's a very dangerous place to be. Then he says in verse 6, we pick up there, Galatians 2 6. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So he's saying, Look, you hate this particular sect of people. So uh, Nicolaitans are. Uh, uh, again, not much is known about them. So some people think so. There are, you know, when you read commentaries and people have tried to go back into history and try to find out what was this particular group that is mentioned here, the uh, Galatians. Uh, again, I'm not an historian, but I, I read the commentaries, and so uh, one commentary said that well, this group was a they, they go by the name Nico Latians. So Nico is to be a ruler. Latians has to do with the laity. So this group was a sect where they really suppressed the laity. Nico Latians, based on that name, they come up with this idea that this was a particular sect of a group of people where the laity were really suppressed. So that's one thought that is given. Some other people talk about this Nicol latest because they're, they're repeated again later in the other churches. Uh, that there are people who practiced immorality, those kinds of things. So, what exactly this particular sect was, there are varying opinions or thoughts. Uh, but whatever it was, the church in Ephesians recognized. That particular sect and said we will not have anything to do with it, we will not engage with it, we will not participate in what they are doing. And so the Lord commends them for that. And even the Lord says, I did, I hate that. I hate what they're doing, whether it was engaging in sexual morality or engaging in suppression of the deity. So I hate them. So and then verse seven, uh, I listened to seven. He promises to all who overcome, to him who overcomes, they lead to the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. They will eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So the tree of life, which is symbolic of health and healing. See that again, Revelation 22, at the tree of the leaves of the tree of life. Is for health and healing, so longevity, and strength. So that's what it represents. It's in the midst of paradise. So, what I just want to comment here is that in Revelation 2 7, we see the, par the paradise in or paradise in heaven. So, just as a side note, up until the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, up until the resurrection of Jesus, paradise was in Abraham's bosom, which was a compartment uh, of Hades, but it was the place where the Old Testament saints were kept. So Hades had two compartments, it was hell, 
Abraham's paradise or Abraham's bosom. So when, the, when Jesus gave the story of the rich man and, and Lazarus, Lazarus had died and he went to Abraham's bosom. The rich man died, he went to hell, a place of torment. When Jesus was dying on the cross, he told the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. So paradise was Abraham's bosom. It's in the lower parts of the earth, the compartment of God. But when Jesus ascended, Ephesians chapter 4 says, he took captivity captive with him. That means all these Old Testament saints were held captive in paradise in Abraham's bosom until the resurrection of Jesus. When Christ ascended, Ephesians 4, he took them with him. So paradise was moved from there up into heaven. So in the New Testament, you see, uh, after the resurrection of Jesus, you find paradise in heaven. So when Paul writes about this in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, I was caught up to the third heaven, paradise. So paradise now is in the third heaven. Again, here, Revelation 2 7, some paradise is being up to us being in, 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 in God or in heaven, the paradise of God. Just a side of the place to understand this difference. Okay, so let's move forward now. We're going to read about the other churches from the one and just try to understand. So the key takeaway from the church in Ephesus is for us is keep increasing in your first love. While we are doing all the other things which are right, being zealous for the law, discerning, enduring, persevering, is all good things. But Keep increasing personal. Just put back the prayer. It's a lot. I want to keep my focus on you. I want to keep growing my love for you. And I want to keep that as a focus in my life. While I serve you, yeah, do all the other things that keep us number one. Do the first works. Just to love him, worship him, spend time with him, spend time in his world. Do the first works. Then do the ministry. Let's go. Revelation chapter 2, let's read please from verses 8 to 11. So we can read the rest and then we'll look at it. Revelation 2, 8 to 11. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. And to the angel of the church and write these things says the person who last who was relevant in July. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulations ten days. Be faithful until death, and I'll give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So, the Lord Jesus introduces himself to the church's spirit. As the one who's the beginning and the end of everything. Everything begins with everything, everything ends with the first of the ends. He also introduces himself as the one who was dead when he came back to life. You will, you will notice that in every introduction, there is a relation to what that particular church is going through. In the previous Introduction to the church in Ephesus. He said, I'm, I'm the one walking around the middle of the candlesticks. Be careful because I can remove your candlestick from my presence if you don't repent. Here, the church in Smyrna is facing death. Or some of them are face death because of the persecution that's coming against them. They're going to face hardship. 
And so in that context, he says, I want you to know, I'm the beginning and the end of it, and the first and the last. And I am one who was dead, but I'm alive, meaning even life is in my hands, is, is in the hands of the Lord. And to say, look, do you understand who I am? So that what you're facing is not going to overwhelm you. So, very important. We may face hardships in life as this church was about to face. He's warning them. But he's reminding them remember who I am. I'm the first of the last. I'm the one who's dead. So, don't even be afraid of the dead. The persecution you're going to face and the death that some of them, some of you, are going to face. So he calls them, says, Be faithful unto this. Now, notice he says, I know your works, that phrase, I know your works for every church, the tribulation you're facing and the poverty, but you're really rich, but you're rich. And the blasphemy, blasphemy of those who say they are Jews are not, but are synagogue of Satan. So this church is facing a lot of persecution. And it seems like in the natural, they were poor. Poverty. So uh, remember what James writes. James says, you know, James chapter 2, remember those who are poor in this world. But they are rich in faith. Statements. It's possible. That not it's possible. The fact is, God calls people who are poor. Now, they may be poor to start off with. That we know there's poverty in different parts of the world. And uh, but those people, God saves them. They come to faith in Jesus. And though they may be poor, yet they are rich in faith. And that's what Jesus says. <laughs> I know your works, tribulation, poverty, but you are rich in faith. You're rich. And we know James too says they are rich in faith. So uh, just because some people get saved and they are poor, we don't look down on them. You must understand that they could be rich in faith, even though at that particular moment in life they may be in a state of poverty or coming out of poverty. Recognize their faith. That's what the law recognizes: poverty, but you are rich in faith. Now, here in Smyrna, and you will see this again in the church in Philadelphia. Look at that a little later. Uh, they are facing a group of people, Jews. They claim to be Jews, but the Lord says they're actually the synagogue of Satan. That means this group of people, synagogue representing an assembly or a gathering of Satan. So it's it, it seems like these people, they claim to be Jews, but they are opposing the Christian church. And the Lord Jesus addresses that group in a very strong way. They are the synagogue of Satan. They are the assembly of the gathering. These people are actually inspired by Satan. And this group is persecuting the church. It says they are going to do not fear the things which are about to suffer. They are attacking the church, persecuting the church. And what they are doing is actually the devil doing it through them. It says the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. And so that means this group is actually inspired and instigated by the devil, Satan. And here they're persecuting the church. And some of them are even going to be put into prison. So the Lord's warning them. And you'll they'll have to be you know some for 10 days. So he's saying, look, I want you to be faithful to that. I'll, 
I'm really, look, even if you have to die, I want to be faithful. And you'll see the crowd. So the church in Smyrna is one of the two churches in among these seven who don't receive a rebuke. So the other church is the church of Philadelphia, uh, which we, we will read about in chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. So Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia, they don't receive a rebuke. But I want to ask a question. I want us to think about something. In Revelation 3, verses 7 to 13, the church of Philadelphia, they are also facing the same group of people. We will see in Revelation 3, 9, just, just comparing these two churches. Revelation 3, 9. He says, indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews but are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Revelation 3, verse 9. So the question that's in my mind, and which I want to just put forward to us is this. Revelation 2, verse 9. There is a church in Smyrna. They are facing this group of people. Jesus refers to them, they are telling their truth, their synagogue of Satan. But in Revelation 2, these people harm the church. They put some of them in prison. Church of Spirit. Revelation 3, verse 9. Church in Philadelphia. They're facing a similar group. Jews, synagogue of Satan. But to them, Jesus says, I will make them come down and fall at your feet. And they will know that I have loved you. So I have a question for us to discuss. Why is there this difference? Smyrna, the same group of people are attacking them, putting some of them in prison, persecuting them. Some of them will suffer for 10 days. Philadelphia, same group or I say similar group. So the God of Satan. But Jesus says, I'll make them cut down and bow at your feet. And they will know that I have loved you. Two local churches. Both churches belong to Jesus. Both churches made up of believers. Why? In one case, the church is suffering, being persecuted, being put in prison. Why in another case, same people, others will come and worship, bow down before the church. What could be the reason? Uh, we don't have it stated here, but I just want us to think. What could be because if you if you and I were given a choice, we'd say we all want to be like the church in Philadelphia. We want to see the synagogue of Satan come and bow at our feet. Why is there this difference? What could be the reason? I'm not saying we have a very clear answer, right? Because it's not given to us. But could we just think about it? And I would like to hear your thoughts. There is no right or wrong answer because you know we can't. Uh, through or disprove these things, but it's good for us just to think about it. For anybody you want to share, please go. I hope you understood my question. And, you know, what's the difference between the church of Spurn and the church of Philadelphia? They're facing the same enemies or same type of enemies, but one is being persecuted, one is in a place of dominion. Why?
any thoughts? I'll just share my thoughts. Uh, I think uh, the motive is for them to hold on to their faith, as we see in both of the instances uh, in the Church of Sunna, he says, uh, be faithful to the end. And then this, uh, as I was reading the Church of Philadelphia, he says, hold on to uh, what, you, what you have. So, uh, I mean, even in today's world, we see missionaries, they are giving up uh, their life. They, they die, they get persecuted. But not all pastors actually get persecuted. Uh, so, doesn't mean uh, God was not gracious to them or uh, God was gracious to us. Uh, like some pastors, they go through persecution and they are not martyred. Right? They are alive, they stand strong. But also some, uh, they give up their life for Christ and even their death uh, becomes uh, a testimony. Doesn't mean we all have to go to prisons, be tested, but some pastors actually they go, they sometimes they go, they stand strong for Christ over there. And uh, what what I believe in, I mean what I'm thinking is end of the day it's about us holding on to our faith, us holding on uh, to the word. And uh, the devil knows where we are weak and that's where he's gonna hit us. And that's gonna be different for uh, every one of us. That's what that's what I'm thinking. Uh, so even if we get persecuted, even if uh, we go to prisons or anything, we we are have to hold on to our faith. And in the Church of Philadelphia, if we uh, like if we have the use the authority and the devil is uh, coming under our foot, again that should not give us any pride, and we still have to uh, hold on to our faith. I, I'm just seeing it in that way. Yeah. Okay, good talk. Go ahead. Um, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. I was also looking at uh, the wordings uh, in both the cases. One is, in at least in my Bible, uh, in the Zen KJV, the heading is for the church in Smyrna as a persecuted church and the church in Philadelphia as a faithful church. Um, and even for the other churches, uh, there has been different, um, you know, descriptions given. So I believe God is uh, trying to um, reveal um, different uh, uh what to say different uh, aspects um or uh, different sections of people whom he would find during those last days and uh, especially in the in this uh, wordings or the words that he is um, even quoting here uh, it says that you that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days so he's very um, specifically mentioning um the reason that uh, why uh, it says that you might you are about to suffer and um all that as if jesus is giving a prior uh, you know warning to the church and trying to encourage them um, to be faithful until death. Whereas uh, in the case of uh, church in Philadelphia, um, it's uh, it's presented, uh, the message to them is presented as if, uh, you know, they have, um, he's, he, he has found them to be faithful. And uh, so he is saying that, uh, I know your works. I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength. You have kept my word and you have not denied my name. Um, and he, it, it goes on to say that I will make those of the synagogue of Satan um, to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Uh, so it's, it's uh, I feel different aspects of um uh the journey of faith uh if if we compare the churches to you know believers like 
different uh, sections of believers. Um, I would say uh, uh, maybe it is uh, God is uh, saying the church in Philadelphia is already a kind of a faithful church, you know, and the other one is uh, it's a persecuted church. And though, uh, you know, they they are um, they have um, Jesus is saying, I know your works and all that. Uh, he's encouraging them to be faithful to the uh, to the end. It's not like he, they are abandoned, but he's encouraging them, though they'll go through the tribulation, but be faithful to the end. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Anyone else wants to share anything? Um, I'll just share my my thought. It's very similar to what Divya and Yekina shared. Um, so when it comes to uh, church in Smyrna, um, you know, as, as uh, the word, uh, I'm going to test that is the part of the word which we saw. Uh, so it's uh, because the word says, uh, indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. Uh, that's one word which we see. And uh, towards the end, he say, be faithful until end. Uh, and also when we see the towards the end, uh, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So it's also giving a hope uh, of uh, life with Jesus, and uh, the you know they, they'll escape the second death, then they overcome. So what we also see in Romans chapter five verse three is tribulation produces perseverance. So uh, I think is encouraging the church when they go through tribulation, continue in that to uh, to have perseverance in their lives. So when it, when you compare that with church in Philadelphia, um, as uh, Lily already mentioned about those verses, when but we look at verse ten. Uh, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come up in the whole world. Um, and in verse uh, eight also, he says, uh, "You have, for you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name." So maybe this church would have already gone through a lot of tribulation, um, a lot of a uh, lot of problem already, and they have kept the word of God. They have kept uh, the commandments. And because verse 10 also says, you have kept my command to persevere. Then God is saying, I'm, I'm going to uh, stand with you and I'm going to bring you a place of dominion. Uh, so it, I think it's, it is to do with the time of testing and tribulation that every church needs to face. And I think Smyrna is yet to face the level of tribulation and um, Philadelphia church had already gone through it and have overcome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Good, good. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts. So, I think the the summary of what we've been hearing is one is that it's not that either of, either the church in Smyrna or the church in Philadelphia, one is better or the other. Because the Lord says, even to the church in Smyrna, I know your poverty, but you are rich. So he's actually saying, hey, you are rich spiritually. So that means they're, 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 they're pretty good spiritually. But I think uh, the two things that we pointed out, just to summarize, was that church in Smyrna, church in Philadelphia, we have to be faithful to the end. So that's regardless of what we are going through, what we go through, uh, we will all have different experiences. But we have to be faithful to the end. Second thing that seems to be coming out from what you know, we've shared is that you know the churches are in a different stage in their journey, their spiritual journey. So again, this is what we are trying to infer. We can't so prove it, but it's probably the church of Smyrna is facing these things so that they can be tested and prove their faithfulness, whereas the church of Philadelphia seems to have already gone through that phase. Because he says, you know, I know of your perseverance. I guess. I know you've not been a good name. So we've gone through, you've been faithful 
power. So maybe the church of Smyrna is in that stage where they are proving their faithfulness. The church of Philadelphia has come into that place of having proven their faithfulness. And that's putting them in a place of dominion over the same group of people. And we don't know if the same group of people, the synagogue of Satan, these assembly people, demonic inspired, but had troubled, most likely, they would have troubled the church of Philadelphia in the past. But this church has stayed strong, and God is saying, Now you're going to see, they come and worship at your feet. And most likely, the church of Smyrna is making that journey right now. They're going to face these hardships, but if they prove their faithfulness, they're also going to see. The same sort of procedure comment about that. So uh, I think that's one way to look at it, to understand it. I'm not saying you know we can necessarily prove all of this by chapter and this just a way we're trying to understand it. But uh, all of us have to be faithful. We are making our different journeys. The local churches, even local churches are making their journeys with God. So we go to different stages, we go to different seasons. We call to be faithful, and people definitely come into that place where those who persecute, those who afflict, those who cause us harm, the Lord had caused them to come and bow before the church and recognize that we are So that's a, that's the whole thing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. So the, the church at Smyrna, they, uh, they are in that stage where they are facing those hardships. The Lord is alerting them, look, this is going to happen, but don't give up. Be faithful to the end. You will receive the reward of the crown of life, and you will overcome the second death. Let's read well, verses 12 to 17. This is the church in Pergamos. Let's read that. Uh, before I break, you'll see what we can answer. So, Revelation 2 12 to 13, please, uh, 17, please. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write These things says, He who has a sharp two edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I'll give some of the hidden man manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Amen. So, look at how the Lord introduces himself to the church and the context of that church. Here he's saying, I've got a double-edged sword going on, meaning the word of God. You know, the word of God is double-edged sword. What is the issue in the church? It has to do with the word of God. In other words, he's saying, hey, church, I I'm just paraphrasing it, I'm just putting it in simple language. But I don't mean to be disrespectful, but simple. The Lord is saying, church, I am the one who speaks the uncompromised word. So I'm going to speak the double edged sword, the uncompromised word. But the problem you're having is you're compromising the word. So that's the connection. So the church, when I say this particular local church, that's the immediate context, but we also apply it to us as, as, as local churches. The church 
must hold on to the uncompromised, uncorrupted word. So when the Lord is speaking to the church in Pergamos, he says, look, church, I know your words. I know how you, know, you are in a very difficult city. This is the place where Satan dwells, meaning it's like Satan has made his place here. I mean, Satan's got so much of influence in the city. So the Lord is very aware of the spiritual atmosphere over the, that particular city where they are and over the cities where we are. Satan is dwelling. Devils made his house. So that's the spiritual atmosphere in the city. Satan works. Uh, the Lord is rec recognizing that even in from the church of Pergamos, there was this man called Antipas who died as a martyr. So faithful. He died as a martyr for the Lord Jesus. But the problem with this church has to do with the doctrine, the teaching with which they have compromised. That is the problem. So what is the problem? They have embraced the verse 14. Sorry. They have embraced the doctrine of failure. Sorry. That means this kind of teaching, which the Lord is referring to, it has a doctrine of Balaam, meaning this is the same kind of teaching that Balaam taught a lot, where it was a teaching that God brought the people of God into sin, idolatry, and immorality. And he's saying that same kind of teaching is going on. And the church has accepted it it is uh, it is uh, you know allowing people to hold on to subscribe to that kind of teaching uh, so they're okay with teaching that causes God's people to go into immorality into idolatry and there is this doctrine of Nicolaitans again that's the same group that we read earlier. Another, another, and two, so two kind, two different kinds. One is the doctrine of Balaam, the doctrine of Nicolaitans. And if you, if you go by the meaning of the word Nicolaitans, it's a doctrine that suppresses the laity. If you go by what people say about the practices, it's basically people who practice morality similar to the doctrine of Balaam. But the point is, they have compromised the word of God, the truth of God's word, the doctrine of Balaam, and the doctrine of Nicolaitan. So he says, You repent, otherwise, with the Sodom of the very word that you have forsaken, with the very word that you have abandoned, you're going to be judged. I'll fight against you for the word of God. So think about this. Jesus is saying, I'll fight against his own. In this case, the church in problem is he will fight against his own local church. Not because he doesn't love them, but because of what they've compromised, they've compromised on the word of the law. Okay, so let's pause here. We'll come back and we'll think about this a little bit more after the break and think about how it applies to us. And how today in, in the world in which we live, how important this is to us, but we'll try to apply that to us. Okay, so let's come back right after the break and we'll get to this. Thank you.